Over 100,000 lives ended in Raccoon City on October 1st, 1998. The survivors of the nuclear fire called it the Raccoon City Destruction Incident. Hey, who's come up with this name? The survivors of Raccoon City lived only to face a new nightmare, the war against Las Plagas. But a Terminator was sent back through time to 2004 during Sarah Connor's, I mean, Ashley Graham's abduction. It was a lone warrior, a protector. Its mission, to destroy Sadler, rescue Ashley, and save the world from repeating Raccoon City. The only prerequisite to the Terminator's programming was that it would need to beat Resident Evil 4 Remake with 100% accuracy. Could it be done? Could the Terminator stop Sadler in time? Well, it was now just a question of which one of them would reach her first. Now, I know why you've really clicked here. You're not here for the challenge. You just wanted to see a grown man cry. I said this before, but when I say this challenge was tough, I mean this was like I was constantly edging my brain aneurysm tough. <laughs> this challenge took me over 24 hours of in-game time to complete with over 40 files recorded, totaling 420 gigabytes and the resets, Jesus, the resets. I was certain they totaled close to a million by the end and all of this for your viewing pleasure. Enjoy. <laughs> So as we started off this Chinese water torture simulator in the village of Pueblo, our choice of violence begins after the first villager refuses to help us. I need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. <laughs> Just like this request, the rules of this challenge were simple. Every single chapter would need to be completed with 100% in the result for accuracy. No excuses, no exceptions. I went with hardcore difficulty to still keep it challenging, but also give me some flexibility with resets, which, you know, were plentiful. In addition, there would be no knives allowed, no grenades allowed, and no rocket launcher allowed. I wanted this to be a pure showcase of my technical and mechanical accuracy, so unlike the T-800 from T2, we were going to be inflicting maximum human and non-human casualties. I swear I will not kill anyone. After the village was terminated, our metallic legs carried us over to the windmill area where we target some innocent farmers tending to their crops and livestock and head upstairs to grab the cog. Some vest-wearing cow-faced lunatic enters the arena with a desire to fold us into the pavement. We lure him downstairs into the dynamite we'd left behind like some kind of explosive Hansel and Gretel and we finish the rest of his supporting crew off. Also, like the mentalist I am and if this sh** wasn't hard enough, I was also going to be doing all of the blue medallion quests as well, so we collect these before departing for the next area. We shoot some old men off the bridge en route to the fishing village where I reach the first mentally distressing part of the run. Not only did it feel like these guys were just absolutely insane, but the aiming was feeling pretty jank. Now, that's not to shift the blame from my own failings because- I gotta be honest with you, I, I'm kinda retarded. But this was no CSGO and whilst aim assist is completely off in hardcore, for some reason the aim drag doesn't seem to go completely even when we turn it off in the in-game settings. I got used to it eventually, but the opening chapters were distressing. So in the end, I reenacted Tarantino's scene from Django with the first guy, kicked this woman's legs off after she walks into her own trap, collected all my little troglodyte friends and juiced them all up at the ladder. Yeah, it felt cheap, disgusting almost, but we had a lot more game to get through before we fell apart mentally. In the basement of the house, we find a fellow Terminator unit powered down. Apparently this unit had also been sent back in time along with us as a failsafe to ensure Ashley's rescue was successful, but had suffered critical power loss in the time distortion field before arriving in the basement. As we grab from behind and infected with ransomware by Mendez, we successfully close out chapter one with... What? No, no, all right. I know that sounds bad. With this devastating news, I quickly ran a few tests on how in-game accuracy works. To start with, a great element of this challenge was that I couldn't actually track my accuracy throughout the chapter. We'd only be able to see it at the end of the results screen. It's so dumb. As you'd probably expect, accuracy is counted by bullets hitting what the game classifies as active assets. So enemies, tick. Treasure and nests, tick. Boxes and crates, tick. Puzzles and traps, tick. Any bullet that registered against anything classed as not active would count as a miss. But 
get this right, the game counts shooting crows as a miss. There's no reason for it, because when you use a flash grenade on them, it works fine, but clearly some Capcom dev just wanted to watch the world burn. So when I killed literally the first crow of the game, I'd in fact signed my own death warrant. In light of this, I also quickly tested the shotgun and the grenades out of interest. HE grenades and flash grenades count as 100% hit no matter what, so I'm kind of glad we excluded them from this challenge. But the shotgun was problematic. If any of the buckshot from our shells didn't connect with an enemy, it would count as a miss. So with that in mind, I stuck mainly to semi-automatic weapons, but whilst maximum risk and maximum reward, I'll show you later how I made shotguns work for me. Anyways, after repeating the whole of chapter one again, minus murdering the murder of crows, we do eventually get the anticipated maiden 100% accuracy for chapter one. For this challenge, I'd also decided to do a reset counter so you beautiful individuals could monitor my distress and pain throughout the run. So please enjoy. Chapter 2 opens up with us rerouting emergency power back to our CPU. Despite not having my guns, I stayed true to the rules and made it through the initial area with no knife kills, which we didn't even need. Turns out if you stayed perfectly in an enemy's blind spot like Riddick does in Pitch Black, they just couldn't see you. Once I eventually got bored, I lured these mindless cretins into the bear traps and performed a DIY double amputation. After grabbing our kit, we rendezvous with our favourite cloaked flasher who sells us the bolt action rifle and with our leftover V-Bucks we buy some upgrades that would help to get us through the mountainside. Phased plasma rifle in a 40 watt range. Hey, just what you see, pal. This area highlighted yet another challenge for us. On hardcore, enemies regularly use their insane reactions to dodge our attacks, causing several blood vessels to burst simultaneously in my brain. But we also made the realization that when plagas or other heavy hitting enemies grabbed us, not having a knife to apply self defense justice to their necks basically meant insta death for us. Despite these obvious challenges, and after a number of attempts, the strat that worked best here was to run around and trigger everyone's spawns into the area and retreat back to my little defensive hut, which had become my own personal Sparta. We also accepted the kind donations of the dynamite guys who helped initiate some friendly fire on our behalf. As we stepped over the heap of corpses outside the window, we mop up the treasure and items left over, taking the eagle crank back to unlock the next door. Once we've taken care of our next set of patrons, we give these crows a wide berth before facing up to our next challenger, Pueblo's local medical professional. Now, despite only needing one every three to five years, we receive a non-consensual rectal exam with his chainsaw not once, not twice, but three times. In the end, we lure the doctor into all of the bear traps he probably spent all day setting up for us, eventually embarrassing him to the point where he just dies of cringe. We collect the insignia key and as Mendes begins to give me a throat massage, my heart starts to pound out of my chest as the accuracy results get ready to come in and... Oh, thank God. Chapter 3 starts off like an episode of Pet Rescue before we make it back to the village and into the church area. Everything for a change was pretty straightforward. I actually felt like I was finally enjoying this challenge. We were making progress, we were having a laugh, and it was fun. I was living my best life. Until I wasn't. Eventually we reached the swamp area, and as expected, these soggy, smelly river people provided a serious headache. There were so many of them, I often found myself just completely overrun, which wasn't the optimal environment for hitting shots. I'm sure everyone can also relate to just how insufferable the crossbow goblins were in this game. Just when I was about to land the perfect shot or make a slick move, these fart smellers would hit me in the face and cause a chain reaction that led to my death or a reset. At times they left me thinking that I may commit war crimes, but it was why moments like this were so important. They were like... therapy to me. On my most efficient run through here, we use the first dynamite tripwire to take care of the brute and disarm the second one so we can blow the village mob up who are following behind us. We were able to hit a checkpoint and grab the petrol before filling the boat up to tackle Del Largo. Now, despite the harpoon mechanism feeling like I was launching soggy breadsticks half the time, there was actually an achievement for doing this without ever missing a shot that I'd already got. So with my confidence running high, we beat him on our second try and close out chapter 3 with the 100% we needed. <laughs> chapter 4 starts off with us defining the true meaning of survival horror. And I didn't mean these guys, I meant the state of my inventory. Disgusting! Once on the lake, we grabbed the Red Nine from the boat, and I'd chosen this pistol to be my main go to for the challenge. Having beastly damage stats and a nice little bit of wood that we could attach to the back, it meant that enemies could be staggered a lot easier. For us, that meant when they were in their recovery animation, we could easily predict and line up a follow up shot to their body or head, effectively removing high risk shots when they were dodging or moving from the equation. It also helped us to get through the lakeside puzzle section. We have a few slip ups, but we grabbed the two heads and all the treasure on the lakeside without too much hassle. At one point we ran into a dog who, as we know, could sense Terminator somehow. Maybe it was their heightened sense of smell or their loyalty to their humans. Or perhaps it was this fleshy radar detector that came out of its back. Who knows? 
We pull up gently to the merchant's dock and tune into Pueblo's number one hit song for five weeks running, Glory a las Plagas. Alongside this absolute banger comes our new friend, El Gigante. We take a few slats, but overall, this guy was so big, it was legitimately harder to miss him, which, you know, I still did do, but getting maximum damage into the Plaga with the rifle and Red 9 made it a straightforward boss fight. And just like that, we meet Ashley back at the church, securing chapter four, and we can finally deliver that iconic Terminator line. Chill out, dickwad. No, no, not that one. Come with me if you want to live. We've actually now secured. I was actually required to fulfill my Terminator duties and lay down my Windows XP operating system to protect her, which for the purposes of my 100% accuracy challenge was nothing short of a nightmare. This little blonde head she just didn't have any regard for her own life. Eventually, I opted to fly through the cemetery at Mach 10 speed, treating myself to the high capacity scope on the way back past the merchant so we could hit some American sniper shots back in the town centre. Everyone and their mums were packing head spaghetti around here and we also had another steroid abuser to deal with. We showcased our FaZe Clan credentials by hitting some of the spiciest collaterals in Pueblo before doing a bit of pillaging at Mendez's house I can smell you. and heading back into town to battle the savage Mark. This four-legged hellhound moved like Jet from Valorant, inflicting several resets on us, but after analysing its movement patterns, we easily predicted its next move and transport this little boy to the big doggy bed in the sky. The windmill area was teeming with people again, and after Ashley takes an illegal clothesline to the face, we round everyone up to cleanse their souls and head over to the cabin. Our fellow Terminator from earlier greets us up ahead and has secured our extraction route via the cabin. Senorita has a name and it's Ashley. You are? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. With our primary target secured, extraction protocol was now in effect. But between us and the exit was making it through round 75 of COD zombies. After blocking the windows and buying the MP40 off the wall, we line up collaterals on both couples banging on the window and destroy the red barrel on the far side of the cabin. I separated from Luis here as I wanted to avoid shooting through an enemy that he'd already killed, so I took up a defensive position on the stairs and handled anyone who came up here with a combo of the Red 9 and some more juicy sniper shots. As you'd probably expect, there are plenty of resets here, but after a while I got into the flow of the fight. When stage 2 begins, we move upstairs to defend the first floor from the religious extremists now flowing in through the windows, and eventually I head downstairs to take care of the brute who smashes through our downstairs window. With our professionalism and focus, we take care of him, and after Ashley helps us to escape, we clear chapter 6 with... For love nor money, I couldn't figure out where a shot had been missed here, so we had to go back to the church and start chapter five all over again. This hurt me deep in my soul. I felt physically unwell, but after one hour, 14 minutes and 31 seconds and 29 resets later, we successfully retrieved our 100% for chapter five. After a break and a quick call to my therapist, chapter six kicks off with the merchant showing me his new wear, supplied directly from the LAPD the riot gun. I did purchase it for special occasions only, albeit at an almighty risk. Missing just one pellet would result in a piece of accuracy being lost to the never. However, it did have the tightest spread out of all of the shotguns, so it was best used up close and personal against unarmed protesters, which could actually be perfect for us. I also managed to pick up the stock for the Red 9, which transformed this thing into an absolute killing machine. Stability, accuracy and handling were all increased, and Leon's sex appeal actually received a 10% buff. My Red 9. Smells of rich mahogany. <laughs> we work our way through the ambush segment before reaching the Chainsaw Sisters. We drop Ashley off at the locker. I'll be back. And our World at War Zombies experience continues to come in clutch here as we slipped out the back door and began training everyone behind us in an orderly fashion, taking them out carefully one by one. As with all chainsaw enemies, we had to be careful though. With no knife, we couldn't protect ourselves from the insta-kill chainsaw sweep. With the checkpoint area's conclusion, we suddenly get a strong whiff of cheese in the air, which could even mean that Leon's athlete's foot was flaring up again, or it meant that we were approaching the village endgame and Mendez. This could be the end of us, right? Wrong. This guy was a piece of cake. We move up to the top level of the slaughterhouse, and with the sniper, we land a shot into his back eye after he recovers from one of his lunge attacks. This causes him to drop down to the floor, where we land six riot shots into his back eye, and just like that, his first stage was done. From there, we just go through the motions. We hit the red barrel as he picks up to throw at us before wiping him out to the floor again and landing continuous shotgun shots into his rear eye until death was achieved. Easy, right? You just couldn't miss a shot. Which we didn't.
The merchant starts off by giving us a weapons tasting in his horse stable, where we grab the stingray and broken butterfly before committing religious hate crimes on some of the castle's church attendees. Once we'd finished praying for forgiveness, we have to fight past the crossbow welcome party in the cannon firing range, which I spent the majority of completely on fire. We mop up the blue medallions before enjoying the surprise birthday party that Salazar had organized for me. After using our barrel stuff tech on the shield guys we'd mentioned previously, we head downstairs to play Dungeons and Garridors. With no flash grenades at our disposal, we were obviously all in on the Garridor fight, but take him down first time. We shoot out the gongs in the sword room puzzle and pray to Sadler that they counted positively towards our accuracy percentage before it was time to tackle the aneurysm room, aka Satan's playground. There were four sections here for us to worry about. The first opening section brought shield guides and archers onto the balconies, which already was enough to tip me over the edge. Downstairs when collected the halo wheel. Literally all enemies here had second stage plagas, but you can line up a nice collateral shot here and by using the red barrel on the stingray we can clean them out fairly easily. On our return upstairs we had more crossbow douches and extra backup priests to deal with before the final section, the water cranks. We had plenty of resets here, but to be honest the final section wasn't too difficult. Sure, like multitasking the enemies downstairs whilst defending Ashley upstairs you know, was tough at times and tracking the running and moving targets had its moments, but I found solace in the fact that I'd only have to do this room once since we'd been so careful. It could have been me shooting the class for the cannon, the cannon itself, a dodgy shotgun shot that went awry or just some sick joke. All I know is that's 59 minutes and 4 seconds of my life that I will never be getting back. If rock bottom had a physical form, this was it. This happened at about 1 in the morning and I just sat staring at the wall for a solid 10 minutes questioning my life choices, but I refused to rest without finishing this chapter so at 2am we closed out 7 and headed into 8 the next day. We grab our secret lucky beetle off the wall and treat ourselves to some Kevlar before gate crashing the red pyjama guy in the middle of his best man speech. We take up the rest of his wedding party which would certainly be a day to remember before laughing at Ada as she tries to fight a man made of literal steel. We deal with the facehuggers in the hallway and fight through the rest of the castle section. There are plenty of enemies here but it was nothing we hadn't taken care of before. We hoover up the rest of the loot around the ramparts as we dance around Lurtz's boulder frozen. After we permanently disfigure him and collect Ashley we pocket chapter 8 to 100% and enter the maze of rage. The dogs in the maze did provide me with some grief. We know already that dogs hate terminators but I can confirm that the feeling is mutual. But despite a few complaints to Peter, we'd removed the entire pack of dogs from the maze, taken care of Ashley's abductors and made it to the Grand Hall. We grabbed the snake's head and arrived to remove the denomination of zealots in the goat's head room from the land of the living. It gets off to a good start, with me immediately missing my first shot on the red guy, but eventually the best route was to head into the main room, kill these two knuckleheads before killing the red guy as he appears at the first balcony to sing to me like some weird abusive version of Romeo and Juliet. In between all of this, Ashley disappears down a door that didn't exist, but after recomposing ourselves we clear out the room and arrive ready to collect the lion's head. Whilst fighting the knights, I actually made an interesting discovery. My mind had always been in OG RE4 mode here because when you fight the knights in that game, their heads were always the weak spot. However, in the remake, the plaga controlling the knight can actually be seen oozing out of the side of the armour. If you land a shot here, the knight immediately staggers or drops to the knees allowing us to kick his helmet off. It made the whole process a lot easier and after some tight shots we tidy up this area before heading back to the entrance hall to quickly take care of some squatters, hand over the reins to Ashley to do her thing, closing out chapter 8 with our required 100%. Not gonna lie, for the first time ever I was actually looking forward to Ashley's section. There was no pressure for me to hit shots or worry about accuracy, just a pleasant stroll through this underground sh** hole. I christened chapter 10 by heading down to the basement to murder C-3PO and his droid friends. Oh no! I've been shot! And it was time to meet the spawn of the devil himself, the Navistadors. These things were the living and breathing counter to my accuracy. Their dodging and movement was so unpredictable every shot had now become a risk. However, their strength was at its highest when they were airborne. If they were camoed or we forced them into a tight space, we ripped away their advantage. I'd wait for them to attack and when they were recovering or stunned I could line up an easy follow-up shot. It goes without saying that we had some resets here, mainly because I made some absolutely two-head plays, but we did eventually kill every single Novi in here, which I was quite proud of. Once we finished up here, it meant we could now enter our favourite room, the Blind Man's Bluff World Championships. We did have some cheaters in the mix here who we removed from the playing field, but once we could get down to brass tacks, despite having a few hairy moments, our two challengers were easily defeated and we successfully retain our title as world champ.
In the sewer area, it was time to face up to Verduga, and yeah, you bet your bottom dollar I plan on fighting this bootleg version of Predator. It was tough, don't get me wrong, but with each nitrogen shower we gave him, if we timed it perfectly, we could follow up our kit with five magnum rounds if we were quick enough. Now, from here, we paired our magnum shots with the rifle and shotgun, but we eventually ran out of nitrogen, meaning we had to give it to Verduga raw and wriggling. This part was slightly problematic, as the guy moved like a butterfly and stung like a nuclear warhead. But after funneling him into the tight doorways, we finish up the Dugu and uh, the game decides to spit in my face. Yeah, pain. Pure, unadulterated pain. That being said, I had a sinking suspicion that it was my fault for overusing the shotgun post-nitrogen at times that probably weren't safe. So I replayed the fight for a second time using only my pistol, revolver and rifle and thank Christ, we got 100%. Oh, thank God for that. Whilst on the lift up, when we connected to the Free Pueblo public Wi-Fi, we were airdropped a dodgy video of what appeared to be John Connor, the future leader of the Resistance, talking with the Pope. Hmm. Concerning. Whilst Luis did help to reapply our thermal paste for us, I'm convinced his Terminator smile cursed my chapter 11. He will be visiting all of us in our nightmares tonight, but as we entered the mines, we had twice the amount of Terminators that we had before. So when the second Terminator asked us what we wanted to do, our response was to do what we do best. Terminate. My highlight being Dr. Salvador running at me whilst on fire and severing the wiring in my spinal unit. You got this! No. No, I haven't, Luis. Always remember, ladies and gentlemen, that marriages that chainsaw together stay together. So we send Salvador and his wife to the afterlife together and grab the dynamite to start our fight with the two El Gigantes. There's not much to say about this fight. With two Terminators against two very fleshy roided up soy boys, it wasn't much of a challenge. I killed the first one in about 10 seconds and the second one, despite requiring a tight shot onto his back to blow the dynamite, is again melted away almost immediately. Now comes one of my favourite parts, the minecart ride. I always laugh thinking of the Terminator's emotionless faces riding through the twists, jumps and turns in the minecart, but overall this section was pretty fun. All the boards, targets to change the tracks and red barrels all counted as hits and we got to take more of our built up rage out on all the crossbow guys, capping our journey off of us sending Dr. Salvador to the pits of hell one final time. Once we arrive at the end of the line, we cause a domestic disturbance in the Novi's family home before none other than John Connor arrived, fatally destroying our fellow Terminator's power unit before turning to face us. Through the tapes his mother had left him, Connor knew where to find us and what we were doing, but believed instead of saving the world, it needed Las Plagas. Sadler had sold him on the new world order that Los Illuminados could provide and could now kill two birds with one stone. By destroying the Terminators and the future resistance, he would secure Las Plagas' future. We would obviously have something to say about this. Terminator's combat files were fully up to date with the latest hand-to-hand -hand CQB fighting techniques, but even when we drove Connor off, the 100% here felt hollow. We'd lost a Terminator brother. The leader of the future resistance we were trying to save had turned against us, and our confidence had never been lower. Despite this, we had to push on. We do some backtracking and clean up in the castle section, snapping up some outstanding treasure, taking care of any straggling enemies. And we also get the metal shit scared out of us when this random knight came back to life. We cleaned Salazar's frame room, which was full of possessed maniacs and posed from some thumbnails before momentarily lagging out of our Skynet connection. Eventually, it was time to head over to the clock tower and the fight up here was stinky. Not only because I was having to contend with my own idiotic self, but there was a large array of enemies here to handle. Just to help make my life even harder, which seemed to be the running theme here, I refused to use the spike balls to kill any enemies, so waited patiently for the reinforcements to arrive before sending them and everyone on the lift straight back to hell. It was then time to meet Salazar, who is a difficult boss at the best of times, but on a 100% accuracy run, I thought this would result with me putting my head through the drywall at least once. It was mainly due to the moments in which he was vulnerable, where either times that he was shooting me, or was in a weirdly difficult position for me to shoot from. We end up using a lot of our heals, but the extra time we spent waiting for the perfect opportunities to strike seemed to pay off because we took him down first try. Sensational. On the way down to the boat, I forgot about these knights again, so we get jump scare number two out of two. Fair play, checkmate knights. And despite having a myocardial infarction, we secure our coveted 100% for chapter 12. As our eyes glowed red in the night on the boat ride over, we remind Ada that Terminators didn't have the capacity for human emotion, so her flirtatious nature was completely wasted on us. The start of the island leads us to the military welcome party and we greet my fellow Skynet Terminator machines with a hearty It is nice to meet you. We shoot a few nerds right at the start and we enter the fray in the main area. The Killer 7 was an absolute must-have as it exactly matches Arnie's gun from the first Terminator film. 
We breezed through the phone book in the first section, taking out all the Sarah Connors in zone one, but weirdly had a monumental struggle in the upper level. The autosave here was in a really awkward and draining place, so every time I reset, I had to come all the way back down here and repeat it all again. There's a lot of plaggers in the lower area as well, who can also shoot through walls apparently, and a huge army of enemies up top. My strat was to run straight here, using the cliff defilade to let the RPG guy get his shot off. We'd then sprint up to the top of the hill and take care of the two guys waiting for us there, and shortly after, if we were patient enough, the large group of enemies behind us will have formed conveniently around the red barrel, which, if you can survive the claustrophobic circle of death long enough, provides a nice multi-kill. From there, it's just clean up duty before the RPG guy in the next area, who's apparently got mashed potato for brains, does us a massive solid. Everyone up until the lab was business as usual, including the brute guarding Ashley, but that changed when we hit the regenerators. For now, they were just a mild inconvenience, but they still had the ability to make me dump my engine oil at my rear at any given moment. Without the biosensor scope, we just dodge around them and their decups so we can recover the key card and head downstairs to recode it. Now, we could just kill the wrench regenerator to save time, ammo, and reduce my blood pressure, but I'm just not about that life. We spawn all of them in and kill the four boys and their dump trucks before defending the key card whilst it upgrades. And just like that, we've successfully achieved our 100% for chapter 13, but we now had a mountain to climb. For those that don't know, this chapter is packed to the hilt. There's Iron Maidens, Regenerators, an army of mercenaries, the Sewers, the Bulldozer, and Krauser. There's a lot here to get through, so the prospect of having a repeat of chapter 6 was giving me heart palpitations. We did some shooting at the Rangers, obviously no 100% run would be complete without it. And we pick off the blue medallions in the opening area very, very carefully. Ashley takes a hatchet to the face whilst we take on the enemies in the smelter room, but she then gets abducted for another door that doesn't exist. But whatever, I'm not even going to question this anymore. We make it to the sewers and are confronted with another huge challenge. No, not the Iron Maiden. These puzzles and the gate switch. I can't be the only one who A, doesn't understand how they work and B, hates them. But to touch on the Iron Maidens quickly, they were annoying, yet interesting. They were a lot quicker than Regenerators and had only one weak spot found in the center of their forehead. Because of their speed, they have weird movement, which makes tracking their head pretty difficult. Also, they throw themselves randomly to the floor like some child having a cataclysmic meltdown. So in the end, we kill its first phase as usual, but go behind it to force it to drop to the floor, allowing us to line up a killer seven shot square to their face. Also to note, this is one of those enemy types, unfortunately, where if we get grabbed, it's game over, as we won't be able to escape from its grasp before we get aggressively acupunctured to death. We protect Ashley from the intruders in the sewer area and handle the next Iron Maiden by forcibly waking them from their slumber in the trash and stun locking it in place on the floor. Before long, it was time to tackle the bulldozer section. Without any grenades, we're forced to see this part through to the end, which was fun. If your idea of fun was being repeatedly punched in the face with a brick, we had a few resets here, as usual, namely due to my own incompetence, but eventually we get into a nice flow. We take out the first wave without much of a problem, and when the next wave spawns in, we quickly kill the shield guy as he drops down to the arena and take care of our first walking milk producer. The third wave sends in the cowman's brother and a few other cretins who weren't too much trouble, leaving the final group, which consisted of a couple of rocket launcher guys, a few generic Joes, and a small sprinkling of face huggers. Once we were done here, we call the lift down, but head back to the lab to murder the disgusting creature in the basement. This guy's a bit more chunkier than the other Iron Maidens and has a number of supporting parasites along with the one in its brain. Nine, to be precise. The guy also moves at nightmare speed, making aiming even more difficult, but if we're not feeling in an honourable mood, if we shoot him immediately in the back, we can stun lock him in place and cause him to self-combust with relative ease. Dishonourable, yes. But preferable, also yes. We head up the lift, but one of the hits from the Iron Maiden must have damaged our targeting system because a malfunction causes us to accidentally shoot a pensioner in the face. Ashley awkwardly has to help him to the local infirmary, so we press on and clear out the campsite before finding a weird photograph in one of the tents. Who the f*** is this? John Connor, being the upstanding moral leader he was, had heard that we'd shot an old man in the face, so declares that we had to be decommissioned. Not only because we were a Terminator, but because we were a menace to this society. Which was true. As you Resident Evil 4 chads know, Krauser is basically like a light version of Wesker. The guy moves at the speed of light and made shooting him just impossible at times. My anxiety about missing a shot by accident and finishing the chapter below 100% had never been higher. The first phase involves me getting stabbed in the face a lot as without a knife I can't defend against any of his attacks. And also a lot of resets as I try and work out what the hell his movement patterns were. After mastering the opening section, I managed to get a few rifle shots into him at the start and despite the immense risk of missing, took Connor down with just my Red 9. His next few appearances simply require a single shot for him to leave and give me epilepsy, and we're able to clear the way ahead of trip mines and auto turrets. In the penultimate area, despite being made into a kebab by John, we land a killer seven shot to his face as he makes his dramatic entrance and follow up with a red nine to force him to his final stage. 
John reveals that he's absorbed experimental machine phase matter provided by Sadler and had become the very thing he'd set out to destroy. With our exclusively enhanced Killer 7, aka the Sarah Connor Killer, we dance around the arena and wait for the perfect moment to strike. When John had finished a move like jumping or attacking, there was a split second where we could line up a pretty safe shot to the head without him blocking us and surprisingly, we beat him first time. Honestly, I legitimately thought we'd be stuck here for hours. After sending John to meet Carl Reese, the relief we felt when the chapter end showed 100% was immeasurable. The thought of having to repeat this chapter made my butthole clench to the size of a raisin, but now we had just two more chapters to go. The island resistance were on high alert following the death of John Connor, so it set up a series of checkpoints and amassed an army to stop the Terminator that had killed their leader. We shoot a couple of them across the map at the start and just as we were about to engage the first checkpoint area, a HK Veto arrived, apparently having been sent back in time as well to support our final push to save Ashley. Not wanting to take the cheat way out too much, I drag everyone inside and fight them all myself. You know, I appreciate the sentiment of the HK unit, but I'm not taking any handouts here. Once through the roadblock, the HK is chased off by an anti-aircraft gun, which leaves us to fight the remainder of the area ourselves. But we were in our rhythm now, and we were making light work of this section's garrison. We take out plagas, machine gunners, plaga spiders, and everything in between up to the turret. I wasn't really sure how the accuracy worked here, so I was very, very delicate to avoid any mistakes. Between us, I was kind of glad to see Mike leave, to be honest. I know I've got a triple armoured hyper alloy combat chassis, but the guy's got no concept of friendly fire or danger close, and at one point, I even had the perfect headshot lined up before Mike disintegrated them. Yeah, gee, thanks Mike. The next area provided me with a Terminator version of a migraine. We immediately pinged both heads off the turret guys, but there were waves upon waves of enemies that flooded into the area like Locust, with available enemies getting back onto the previously vacated turrets. After fighting for my life to get to the first switch, we get another wave of enemies and a brute that joins us alongside my arch nemesis, the crossbow guys. We 1v1 the cowman and the stakes had never been higher approaching the second switch. A missed shot now would send us all the way back to the beginning of this section to repeat this hellscape again. Through our sheer reluctance to die, we methodically clear the entire area before watching the HK unit get flambéed. As retribution, we sterilise all the remaining Novies and the Iron Maidens in the next area and it finally happened. I actually missed a shot on one of the blue medallions, but lucky for us, our checkpoint was just here, so no progress lost. Our focus now turns to the last stand of Los Illuminados. The roadblock up ahead was stacked, but we take care of the first brute by blowing up the Hello Kitty watch on his wrist and press into the area where the turret switch was being held hostage. But this is where I fell apart. I was just having the absolute worst time trying to hit anything. I'd suddenly lost my mojo and eventually my head, so after reset, after reset, after reset, I decided to go downstairs and have a glass of chocolate milk to relax and reset my state of mind. Coming back refreshed and relaxed and immediately miss more shots and resets after resets after resets. <laughs> Anyways, eventually I pulled myself together and we used the red barrels to clear out our pursuers, working our way through the bulk of the Citadel's forces. We take care of the second pig guy and switch the Skynet targeting systems off before clearing out what was left of the garrison. With everyone successfully unalived on the way into the Citadel, I'd actually forgotten about the rocket launcher guy who fires an absolute Hail Mary directly into our face, which, if this was canon, would have actually won the war for them. Before we can retrieve Ashley, Sadler uploads an undetectable Trojan horse virus into our system over the Pueblo public Wi-Fi we'd been connected to and was now in full control of our body. This was it. I was seconds away from a man claiming to be from my bank remoting into my system and asking for $500 worth of gift cards. But right on time, Ada had come to the rescue like a reincarnated version of Sarah Connor. It interrupts our Wi-Fi connection just long enough to regain control of our system, rebooting and saving Ashley from the sacrificial altar. I help Ashley to exercise her demons while she updates my McAfee antivirus and helps to run a full virus scan. And we've done it. Just one more chapter to go. 16. And Sadler. After everything we'd accomplished, including the four hour long antivirus scan we did in the lab, we couldn't fail now. My endgame arsenal consisted of the Red Nine, the Killer Seven and the Stingray, all of which I'd maxed out to exclusivity. Now, Sadler's first form requires you to shoot the eyes on his legs to weaken him enough so he collapses to the floor, exposing his main eye to damage. After the first couple of phases, Sadler grows two more eyes on his back legs, meaning we had four in total to hit to get him down. Two well-placed shots from the Killer 7 were easy enough to accomplish this and get our first cycle of damage into his main eye, but we had a little entourage of Invisador bodyguards to deal with as well who were seriously annoying and also made it difficult to concentrate on what Sadler was doing around us. Even after clearing them out so we could 1v1 Sadler, he'd run away to the top platform to call more of them in, which we dutifully took care of. 
On top of this as well, Sadler's moveset was erratic and tough to predict. We relied on using his recovery phase from his attacks to land the shots we needed to stun lock him in place and apply our two magnum shots to his leg eyes. I realized that patience was the key here. We couldn't rush this. We'd start by clearing out the Novies to give me a clean area to work in, and we'd use the Killer 7 to break the leg's eyes before using the Stingray's superior fire rate to maximize our damage output into his main eye. And lo and behold, after our patient tactics, he collapses down, and this was it. We'd done it. We sign off on a high and hit all of our shots into his embryo to celebrate, and after Ada's assist, we shoot our last shot of the run, the Red Rocket Launcher. And there you have it. Can you beat Resident Evil 4 Remake with 100% accuracy? Sure you can. If you like pain, stress, and anxiety, then you'll love this challenge. To confirm for all you keen watchers, we ended up sending 888 men, women, and aliens to the underworld and had a total reset counter of, drumroll please, 381. Sickening, yes, um, but understandable given the circumstances. This was a journey, to be sure, and despite popular belief, I actually really enjoyed making this one. It tested our abilities, but remained interesting and overall a very enjoyable challenge to make. As always, you mad lads, if you made it this far, you are the absolute goats, and thanks for watching.